Hey, Andrew. Hey, Fabiano. Hello. Oh, Tilo. Long time, long time no see. Do you hear us okay, Tilo? I can hear you at least, Andrew. Okay, sure. yeah, no, I was, I was checking, it seemed like Tilo's audio might not be working. I'm, I'm not sure it's me or you, Andy, but I see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. Okay, it's let you, me just Tilo. drop a message in the chat. All right, we have a lot of folks today. It's great. I just posted a link on the attendance. So you please go ahead and add yourself. And let's give it a couple more minutes and we can get started. Left. Right. <coughs> uh, awesome. I think we can get started. Uh, thanks for joining. Excited to have the flat car project provide an update. Uh, we have some folks from the community and the maintainers. So yes, take it away. I think it's Andrew or not really sure how to pronounce your name, Tylo or Tilo or <laughs> but yeah, yeah, take it away. Um, I'll I'll pick it up. So and and just little uh, exclamation. So I had said Tilo wouldn't be joining us today, uh, because he's still officially recuperating from a, an accident a few weeks ago, but he was uh, so keen and said, no, you're not going to keep me away from tag run time. And uh, <laughs> so he said awesome. he would, uh, yeah, he would thanks join. For, thanks for joining. Thanks, thanks for making it. But, but it, it does mean that, um, you know, he, he, he hasn't been working for the last, it, the last few weeks. So he's, he's um, not been super close to preparing the presentation. So I will drive through presentation and Tilo, you know, jump in if there's uh, other things that you want to say. So. Uh, just by way of explanation, Tilo is the engineering manager for the flat car uh, project within uh, Microsoft. Um, I'm the uh, uh, product manager overall for the Kinfolk team, including flat car. And uh, Danielle, who's also on the call here, is um, product manager for the for flat car community. Um, so I'll I'll share some. Uh, yeah, some and, and just to make a comment, basically, we we like to have these interactive too. So I mean. We like sure. to ask questions, you know, so the more interactive, the better. Okay. Uh, I am finding I'm unable to share slides. Let me have to update my system preferences. I apologize. So um, I will, while, while I'm, while I'm quickly updating my system, my system preferences in the background to enable 
team soon to share. Um, actually, I'm going to have to quit and reopen to do that. Uh, but uh, I, so I will be back in a second. All right, he's back. I think. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I know that um, we we did a briefing on uh, on flat car container Linux back in 2020, I think, for this group. Um, and uh, you know, quite a lot of time has gone by since then, and quite a lot of things have changed. So. Um, back then, Flatcar was a project uh, out of a small uh, startup called Kinfolk, and we've subsequently been acquired by Microsoft. And I'm sure you know a lot of the questions have been around, well, what does Microsoft want to do with this project, and um, you know what are the intentions here? What's in it for for, uh, for you? Uh, so you know clearly at, at the time of the acquisition, um, we you know it was part of the discussion we had with with Microsoft as Kinfolk team coming in was the, the flat car community was very important to us. Part of the reason for flat car existing even had been the prior acquisition of Core OS by Red Hat, uh, and so we wanted to make very clear that uh, you know support ongoing support of the community was very important to us, and that's something that you know Microsoft agreed to, and in fact it was even let in the announcement blog post. Um, and I, and I think you've seen you know it's coming up for two years now. You've seen Microsoft you know. Um, uh, carry through on that commitment and uh, you know we've opened up Flatcar a lot more to the community uh, and um, recently submitted Flatcar to um, you know to CNCF as a, as a candidate project so you know really kind of just um, following through on on the, the commitment that was made at the time of the acquisition and you know I, I feel really good to be uh, you know to be part of this team and, and to be presenting where we're at today. Um, so I, I was just going to do a a, a few slides just to kind of explain the background for those who hadn't seen the briefing previously or hadn't, um, you know, maybe not up to um, to speed on kind of what, what flat car and container limit is. Um, and then I'll uh, I'll talk a bit about the status of the project and where we're at in terms of the community and building that and, um, you know, drive it with Q&A. And if folks want to jump in while we're while we're talking, please do, um, you know, as we said, the, early on we want to keep it keep it interactive um so one thing that a lot of people don't realize is what flat car even means and i admit when i first heard of the project i wasn't you know it wasn't obvious to me that a flat car and this is a picture i took uh, on my way down to kubecon last year uh, uh, a flat car is a, a piece of rolling stock that carries containers on the railways so it's got a really nice uh, you know obvious kind of connection to uh, the industry we're in which i quite like um when we talk about container Linux, um, so what do we mean by that? How is that different from a regular Linux? Uh, the first thing is that when you're running workloads in containers, all of the dependencies are kind of embedded within the container. So what needs to run on the on the operating system um, host is you know, is much less. Um, you need less based software. You can reduce your dependencies, and you really just include the packages you need to um, to run containers. The second is a, a focus on uh, security and the, the actual um, partition that uh, runs the uh, OS, that hosts the OS files, is immutable. So it cannot be changed. And there's a whole lot of security threats that actually will try and modify operating system files. And none of those are going to impact you. Um, the, the third aspect that we see of the container Linux is um, this idea of updates in fact um you know it was it was really kind of one of the the early inspirations for container linux was was around just how easy it is for say your smartphone to update or your chrome os desktop to update and 
um, you know, it really should be automated and easy and frequent that you're getting the latest updates because, you know, security is all, all about getting the latest security patches installed. Um, the way updates are managed is it's, it's atomic, so it's an entire image. Either you're updated or you're not. You're not updating individual packages uh, and we have the ability to roll back. So if an update doesn't take, then um, it just automatically goes back to the previous version. Um, so we'll, we'll, I can, we can talk a bit more about how uh, update works, updates work if people want to get into more of the technical details. Um, the, the, the last piece is kind of how we, just kind of philosophically how we think about nodes and how we think about provisioning, right? Is it's very much kind of the cloud native paradigm of declarative configuration. You don't go making per node changes during production. Uh, you know that if this node is on version X, then it is on version X and you can see what CVEs are fixed in that and, um, and you know exactly what the state of every machine is. And, and really what this all adds up to is about enabling you know, security and management at scale and just kind of simplifying operations because we do way too much management of individual nodes and you just can't do that when you're starting to um, deploy at scale. So these are kind of characteristics that we see in a container Linux. Um, and I did a case study uh, a while back with Equinix Metal, who um, I'm sure everyone involved in CNCF is familiar with Equinix Metal because they host the uh, the CNCF infrastructure, um, the, the test bed. Um, and a, a while back, they uh, they actually re, uh, re-architected their control plane to run on Kubernetes and chose Flatcar as the base OS for that. Um, and I interviewed their principal engineer for that project, and uh, it, we had an almost philosophical conversation about this. It's, it's because until you actually experience what it's like running you know, a container Linux immutable infrastructure at scale, um, it's kind of hard to imagine how much it simplifies things. Um, but it really is taking kind of the cloud native uh, paradigm and applying that to infrastructure. Uh, and I, I really like that quote. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of kind of the history of where this came from. Um, and, and really it goes all the way back to, uh, you know, the 2000s when Google came out with Chrome OS. Um, and, you know, as, as a way to manage a large number of endpoints really uh, simply, right? So designed for these very uh, simple low-end laptops. But a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, characteristics of Chrome OS that made it really good for managing um, those endpoints actually applied in the server world as well. And that was where uh, in 2013, the company CoreOS got founded and came out with CoreOS Container Linux. Um, and and that, that was you know, really successful, very widely adopted in the, in the cloud native world, um, was really one of the foundational projects, I would say, you know, obviously alongside Docker, alongside Kubernetes, but in, in the very early days of cloud native, it was one of the kind of definitional projects of, of our space. Um, and, uh, you know, it was part of the um, uh, Red Hat acquisition. Um, so CoreOS, the company got acquired by Red Hat and obviously the operating system went along with that. They continued uh, maintaining it for a while, but um, very quickly decided to put their investment into a new operating system where they took some aspects of CoreOS, some aspects of Atomic Host, and um, somewhat confusingly took the name CoreOS uh, forward. Um, but you know what's now known as Fedora CoreOS or Red Hat CoreOS is based on um, uh, based on those OSs and, and goes forward and is you know very uh, very much you know widely adopted and particularly as a base for OpenShift. Um, but we uh, we knew uh, at the time of the of that acquisition that. That was likely to happen. Um, it's a it's a different model. It's a Fedora-based OS, and we knew that a lot of people really just wanted Core OS as it was to continue. Um, and that's why we we did this uh, fork initially, just rebuilding the upstream Core OS for as long as that was maintained by um, you know by the original team behind it. And then when when that was end of life in 2020, from that point on, you know we took over. The maintenance responsibility, updating, um, updating packages, uh, etc., and um, you know, have been doing that really since uh, you know since 2020 for the last two and a bit years. 
Um, so that's where things ca came from. Uh, really, since uh, so since 2021, which was when uh, the Microsoft acquisition happened of, of Kinfolk, uh, you know, we we went from a mode where uh, it was what I would call a vendor-led open source project, right? Where as the vendor behind it, because we were trying to build a business, selling support subscriptions and all of those those things around it, um, you know, we wanted to keep fairly tight control um, to one where we we really wanted to kind of pivot that 180 degrees and say, no, we sure, we, you know, we're going to put the investment and the resources into maintaining um, this project and keeping it alive and successful and thriving. But we want that to be driven by the community and we want to open up everything to the community. So uh, a number of things kind of followed from that. One was core OS was had always been very, very hard to actually go rebuild yourself. If you wanted to get access to, um, you know, to the, the build uh, infrastructure, it was hard to work out how to do that. And that was, you know, something that had taken our team a long time to get on top of. And so we knew that we had to um, simplify the build process and, and really make it easier for contributors to onboard. And second thing was all of our internal chat. We have a lot of internal chatter. We kind of moved um, uh, a lot of that now happens in this um, uh, in Matrix, um, and we opened up a, a Slack channel as well for people to chat there. We had uh, community meetings, so we have a monthly office hours, um, which you know we keep as clockwork. But that's open up to people. Videos are available, um, and even the um, release planning. So you know when we're looking at what's going to get into the next release, who you know what's the logistics be behind getting that release out. Those meetings are happening in uh, in the open as well. There were there were also some things that we did. Uh, we had a commercial version of um, a flat car, so um, a or rather a commercial subscription option uh, where we kind of kept some things behind a paywall. So one of those was security alerts. Um, so we had security alert emails that were going out to our customers, and we we just opened those up to the community um, uh, and. Uh, you know, we've, and we've continued to, to invest in, in the project. I'll share a little bit about some of the activity there, but, um, you know, it's, it's always a fine balance because the most common feedback we have from the users is, we love it, don't change a thing, right? But at the same time, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be a, a thriving active project, we do need to kind of keep it ahead of, um, of, where, uh, of where the industry is going and make sure we have the latest uh, packages and keep everything um, move, moving. Um, and then the last piece here is the independent foundation home. And as I mentioned, you know, we, we've submitted it to CNCF. We took, uh, you know, we did have an, in, obviously as you'd expect before doing that, an internal review of what are all the different options, where could, um, be, you know, appropriate homes for flat car be? Because we knew that, you know, as Microsoft, people would look at, people would always look at it if it's um, homed under Microsoft as, a little bit of a, you know, then what is the vendor influence here? We wanted to kind of provide that guarantee of independent governance. Um, and and really kind of CNCF seemed like the right place because that's where our community was, right? We, we know a lot of the users and where we see them is at KubeCon, right? We see, we see them at K Kubernetes events and CNCF events, and it just seemed like, um, you know, a, a really good fit. So that's why we've um, we've gone down that path. Um, so just some notes on kind of uh, health of the project and how things are looking. Um, we we've actually built an instance of of dev stats uh, to run over the code so that we can produce the same kind of statistics that you have for CNCF projects. Um, you know, over the last twelve months, uh, you, you you can see the numbers there. Basically, it's a a solid number of PR, the solid number of you know issues being raised and closed, and you you know you see kind of that activity. Um, one of the interesting things is if you look at the um, you know the total number of authors over the last you know year and a bit, uh, actually you know only twenty eight percent or so are from you know the Kinfolk slash Microsoft team. Um, and you know, there's there's quite a few from other companies, and you know, including the ones listed there. Um, now, that I'm not trying to claim that this is where we would want it to be in terms of the the volume of contributions. Clearly, are still you know the 
vast majority of contributions come from um, from our team, but it is opened up with, and I think this shows kind of the level of interest and um, the level of exposure that we have across the industry. Um, one asterisk that I noted there is a company called Cloudbase, which some folks may know, um, they've got involved and, you know, put the, put the effort in to um, get on top of the project. And we, you know, we've brought in, uh, I think at least one of their engineers, uh, you know, has uh, maintainer status on the, on the code base and um, they're, they are actually offering commercial support services, uh, which we used to as Kinfolk, we no longer do as Microsoft. So, you know, we have, we know that that's something uh, some users will want. They'll want kind of an SLA based support agreement. And so there are companies out there looking to do that now. Um, uh, uh, and Sorry, just a quick question. Yeah, Nikita, go on. Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, so like the 72% of non Kinfolk contributors that you see, are they more like drive-by contributors or like some of them stick around? And do you also have non kinfolk slash Microsoft maintainers, like people who can approve code? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if I'd call it drive-by um, in the sense that uh, I think they're involved and committed to the project and they're probably using it, but it's it may be drive-by in the sense of, yeah, they'll just make a docs update or there's a package that they want changed slightly and they'll go make that change and they're not active to like core developers in the way that a super mature community product and project has a lot of different companies all collaborating and that's you know frankly that's some somewhere we'd like to get to and one of the reasons for um you know for pursuing a cncf home for the project and i you know i definitely know of other like large companies who've said to me we'd really like to get more involved, but we can't as long as this is a Microsoft thing, right? Um, so that's that's clearly a driver for us. Uh, so Cloudbase is the one company where they they do have um, maintainers on uh, on the project. So that's one company where they have le leaned in and and I would say a more active participants at a, you know, at a development team level. Tilo, is there anything you would add to that? uh if my audio is working <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah you're good awesome um yeah and basically andy summed it up pretty well um the i i wouldn't i wouldn't say we have any drive by uh committers that, because even though we invested a lot in um making os development and flag car really approachable and uh getting you up to speed and maybe uh, half an hour just following a short uh, checklist of things to do. People tend to come back. So they scratch their itch every now and then. Um, but it's more like, you know, users becoming uh, contributors. And they're not just, they, they don't like vanish after they contributed, but um, we usually get contribution. We usually get multiple con contributions over an extended period of time from, from folks. Yeah. Um, and you can see the stars chart. I personally think stars is the absolute worst measure of, <laughs> of anything, <laughs> but people like to see them. And I guess, you know, being a nice, healthy growth rate is, is, is one thing. Um, so just, just to share some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years, uh, I think pretty much all of these are, are since the, the last briefing was done for the for the tag here um i mean hey, Andrew, one question so did you yeah. do you, do you have a um, metrics on the adoption or or, or is yeah that... i have a slide on that in a minute so okay i'll come, I'll come okay. to that yeah um uh so uh after the the red hat acquisition of of core os because they were putting all of their effort into fedora core os the kind of legacy core os container linux re which we were just building downstream of was pretty static for a while. So when we took took that over after the the end of life of, of that upstream and became the new upstream, um, we had a lot of tech debt, I guess you could call it, to um, to work through in terms of updating. You know, even like the Linux kernel was at four nineteen. That's now up to five fifteen. Um, obviously, we're expecting that to go to six x soon. Um, we've uh, and right across the board, I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of of packages that 
uh, have been updated to much more recent versions. Um, we had uh, we had launched early on what we called an edge channel um, that wasn't really serving a purpose, so we retired that. We um, we had an integrated rocket container engine, um, or that was in Core OS, um, so we retired that when that got uh, basically um, uh, retired for, in, from CNCF as an act active project. Uh, I mentioned a lot of the build automation and the, the SDK, which is kind of how you build, actually build the OS, massively simplified that and containerized um, processes. Um, we added an LTS channel, which is kind of counter to the um, uh, the, the philosophy of, of good, uh, container Linux, which is that you, up, you upgrade frequently, but we found there were enterprise customers that really wanted a, they didn't want their kernel changing that often. They wanted to be on more of an LTS kind of, um, uh, uh cadence so we added that it's it's not as long term as um you know as many uh lts models so it's it's kind of an 18 month uh life cycle but um you know compared to a regular every few weeks up uh, potential update that's um you know something enterprises have wanted um we baked in gpu support support we can now run it in fips mode uh we've done a lot of work upstream with um uh, with various communities related to um, uh, to fat current, including uh, you know we have a lot of great uh, collaborations with the Red Hat folks, the ones that work on Fedora Core OS, because um, there are a number of projects that we share in common. So the Igni um, actually it's next point, but one you know Ignition is the um, provisioning component, um, kind of the, for the first the first time boot when it picks up the config and provisions the uh, the node. Um, and, and and so we actually worked with the with the upstream community on on that. Um, cluster API is a big one. Uh, we I don't think we realized quite how much work it was going to be when we got into it. Uh, in fact, I know we didn't realize. Um, but uh, adding support, uh, so upstream cluster API really only had support for Ubuntu out of the box. So um, so adding in support for uh, Flatcar involved also adding support for ignition as the provisioning mechanism, and then with the uh, the AWS, the Azure, vSphere providers, OpenStack. Um, actually, that's something a third party uh, a user has developed. Um, uh, as is about to be merged, I think. Um, so that that's a great example of actually where you know that doesn't come into our stacks as Flatcar development, but you know, there are users putting, uh, you know, significant amount of engineering resources into doing, in this case, you know, cluster API integration for Flatcar. Uh, we see that in a number of other projects as well. So it's an interesting way of thinking about kind of what the engineering activity is around a project. It's not just what goes into the core of the project, but also on those integrations. Um, under the hood uh, of how containers work, you know, the, the, the C groups, V1 to V2 uh, migration has been you know, challenging for a lot of folks. Um, something just, you know, we had to bite the bullet on that. Everyone was ma um, making that progress progression. Um, and pretty excited as well about ARM64. So uh, we worked with, uh, you know, with our friends at Equinix Metal who host Ampere servers, um, the Azure team. Um, so actually Azure announced um, ARM64 support a while back, and Flatcar was one of the first um, uh, OSs supporting that. And but we also work with the AWS folks on uh, Graviton and make sure it works there. And uh, again, kind of you know underscoring the fact that we want this to be a community project. This is not a Microsoft thing. Uh, you know, we we have support for EKS worker nodes, so there's um, you know the project makes it, it has some integrations that make it easier to create EKS workers using uh, Flatcar. We know people are doing that. Um, so I think that's uh, that's super important as we look at kind of how we're resourcing the project and how we think about it. Like this is not a Microsoft thing; it's not an Azure thing. This is something we want to work for the community, and it works across um, really all the platforms. And you know, that's the point here: is like pretty much all the clouds. You know, every major cloud, a lot of the minor clouds. There's quite a few others on here. Um, a lot of the uh, you know, Kubernetes installers allow you to install with Flatcar. Um, uh, Kubernetes service providers, folks like Giant Swarm, um, 
you know, have have flat car as the as the base OS um, integrations into things like the um, you know uh, K three OS we can you can deploy with Cube Spray, etc. So, you know, this is in, important to us because it it means that. Uh, actually, we've actually seen this that you know people will choose to use flat car because they're running in a hybrid environment. They might have some machines on prem, they might have some in Azure, might, they might have some in AWS, and you know they want a common um, a common base for that, and, uh, and and that really kind of distinguishes. I think it distinguished core OS in the first place. We inherited a lot of this, um, but it, we've just taken taken on and doubled down on that. So here's here's the um, adoption slide. So um, first of all, just to explain that chart on the right, um, the so we host an update server, uh, which is a public endpoint that um, people who install Flatcar can pull their updates from, and uh, that obviously only captures a fraction of the actual number of endpoints out there because. A lot of people deploy their own private update servers, um, and particularly for large deployments, right? Um, so what you'll see is people with one or two nodes, they'll use the public endpoint. But if you're running 10,000 nodes or 18,000 like Adobe is, right, then you're not going to be pulling your updates from that um, that public update server. Um, the the other nice thing here is the, the coloring just shows you the um, the versions that people are, are deploying, so you can actually see how you know how quickly versions get adopted. So you, you can see it's pretty much um, you know within within kind of you know three to six months, you've got the you know, majority of people are, are picking up the new um, the new versions. Um, uh, logos logos here from the uh, just what people have listed in the adopters file. Um, I know of. You know a ton more <laughs> users who haven't yet put their uh, the names in there. In fact, um, I see there's a couple missing actually already. I see so there's one plus one, which is one of the largest email providers in Germany. Is Adobe should be on there as well. Um, but uh, you know we have large scale deployments um, and a lot of smaller folks as well. And you know it, it really kind of spans the uh, spans the spectrum. The other thing that's worth pointing out is in the early days of our of the adoption in fact you can kind of see this around kind of the 2020 middle of 2020 time there's quite a steep curve on the adoption and that came through the core os migration so all the folks that had been running core os container linux and wanted to have something that was basically you know um, bug bug for bug compatible as, um, as vincent put in there um uh you know that they they moved to flat car uh, since then most of the new adoption has been you know from people choosing it for new deployments rather than migrating from core os um, so people are choosing it because it's a great platform not just because they need the you know they need the continuity i have a question about that slide yeah. uh, so that endpoints means number of servers right contacting the data yes yeah. okay exactly and do you have a, also um, a deprecation policy for some of the old versions, or, or how long uh, do you, does the community support uh, a specific version of Flatcar? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I am going to I'm actually going to jump a a slide to answer that um, because it'll it'll really help me to um, uh, to talk to this. Um, so we, we actually have these four channels that we we publish on uh, and you know typically every every couple of weeks we're putting out a new release um in alpha right and people are typically not using alpha in production we recommend that they have a little bit of beta and mostly run on stable um and so you know you'll typically see um you know a major stable release every oh are you sharing? I don't see anything. Uh, yeah, when, when I, yeah, 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 when I um, when I stopped out of dropped out of the presentation, I didn't, I didn't show it. Um. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so we we typically have a, a major version of stable every couple of months. Um, you know, with a 
a, a minor release every every month. So every month or so, there's a new stable release, and basically the answer is is it's it's kind of a rolling release process. You are expected to be on the latest within the channel, and if you have you know if you have a bug on version n minus one, then it'll always be you'll always fix it by moving forward. And the only exception to that really is kind of LT, LTS, where um, you know that version is going to stick around for uh, you know for uh, eighteen months. Um, uh, so like how do updates work? Like, can I upgrade from one LTS version to another LTS version? Uh, yes, L LTS is kind of a special case um, because it's you need to update within your stream, but then you then when a new LTS stream comes out, we need to switch that over. And so there's kind of uh, a, a channel. Oh, Vincent. Sorry, sorry go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I must have been, I must have been the one off. I thought that nobody was answering it, so I jumped in. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, hopefully I was answering it. <laughs> um, uh, but um, otherwise, yeah, with within each of these channels, um, new uh, new images are made available and new, let me um, talk to Okay, that's a there's a backup slide on that as well. I'm gonna have to here we are. So I'm gonna have to sorry, I'm gonna have to share this again. Um so what ha so the way that the way an update works from an in place update basically there's two partitions two os partitions on a node so if you're running in in partition a which is going to be the default when you do a clean install um there's a, a service that runs on the node which goes talks to the server and says hey have you got any updates for me if it does it downloads it into uh, the b partition uh, and then at the point when and obviously, if you're running Kubernetes, you don't want to just reboot at random. You're going to set, um, uh, you're going to you're going to cordon and drain the node, and then you say it's it could be rebooted, and then and then you reboot into partition B, uh, and you're you're downloading that as a complete image. So it's not I'll update this package or that package. You're getting a, a full image update. Um, so so that's basically how the uh, update mechanism works in short yes you can you can be on a, a channel and you, you you'll take you'll take like patch and security updates on a particular lts like say the 2022 and then when 2023 comes out you can choose and elect that time to switch to the new new lts update um and it's it's pretty straightforward it's just a reboot um yeah. uh, Marisha, so like thinking out loud like how do automatic updates work with cluster api is it seamless or, or is it pretty similar or how does that work uh so once a node is installed um so tilo has it, uh raised his hand this, sorry <laughs> yeah okay tilo do you want to do you want to jump in uh, yeah, that's it's an interesting question because it, I, I was about to tune in earlier with the upgrade upgrade question, and uh, it really depends how you operate your your nodes in general, right? Um, and even if you use in place updates, so what Andy described is an in place update, and that means the operating system refreshes itself. Um, some some uh, like big operators of flat car clusters just do green res, so they delete a node. Uh, they redeploy and then they use a new image, and that is um, in, in that regard uh, you have the configuration of the operating system outside, outside of the of operating, operating system, uh, outside of the node uh, in ignition uh, configuration description. So this is kind of the um, the approach that Cluster API currently uses. They do node recycling when when they upgrade, right? And I think they're 
I'm, I'm not sure like how well built in an upgrade process in cluster API in general currently actually is. I have heard um, some time ago, actually, some, some sometime last year, that uh, some folks in cluster API were thinking loudly about, about in-place upgrades, the, the, the kind that we've discussed here. But I haven't seen like any uh, any strong move into that direction yet. Would be interesting to explore, of course, because Flatcar gives you that option and it includes rollbacks as well. Yeah, we we did have some discussion around whether we should enable automatic updates by default in Cluster API and decided actually we should respect the semantics of Cluster API, right? The Cluster because Cluster API itself is a declarative um, construct around the node provisioning, uh, and so you know by default you're not going to get those automatic updates for um, for flat car nodes with Cluster API because we deem kind of it, it's the boss basically yeah and i think it it varies too because some folks might be using vms and other folks might be using bare metal right so like for mm -hmm. people using bare metal they, they may want to like the, the only option i guess is uh in place right i mean if they want full automation right uh so there's there's automation around bare metal provisioning as well right so there's definitely ways that we can people do that yeah, yeah but if they're one flat if they're running a previous version of flat car then it's a patch they need two partitions right so to do the to do a like an in place upgrade right right and but that is how flat car is installed it's always installed with those those two partitions it, so there's a dis, there's a standard so there's a standard disk layout for um uh, for flat car sorry let me just so every flat car machine has this disk layer the disk layout. So there's there's the uh, the user A and the user B um, and one oh, okay. one active one oh, passive. So, got it. So even if they're VMs, they they will have this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So let me just. Um, so uh, we we did a, we did a, a survey of the community. Um, didn't get a huge number of responses, but I think you know enough to give us some interesting data. Um, the uh kind of the key thing that we we heard from people was uh, uh in, in terms of when we asked about what would you like to see us work on is just don't mess with it keep it as it is right so people people love it as it is um and it does its job really well uh it's a lot of a lot of what people want is the manageability and security um which is you know why i kind of emphasized that at the beginning because you know that's what we hear that that's what people care about um and you know we had if if you're familiar with nps you know the, the 71 uh, nps is is you know very high in terms of the satisfaction that people have um it's worth worth just spending a minute on how we get releases out um because i think it's it's important to understand that um you know there's a lot of security that goes into this actually there's a lot more detail than <laughs> behind like the security and the supply chain uh, security, and you know, there's there's docs about um, about that piece of it. Uh, if people are interested in getting into it, but I guess the you know the first point is everything is built from scratch. So when you kick off a build, um, we pull down uh, all of the upstream sources. We run all tests. So even an alpha release has all the tests run on it, and we'll pass all the tests. Right. So there's there's a pretty high level of quality across all of those release channels. And then they're distributed via uh, a public image server where you can just pull down, um, you know, pull down the images um, via the update server. So that's that's for the in-place updates, and then via the marketplaces as well. So Azure AWS GCP we publish on all of those. Um, the uh, the if we've got a CVE to patch, it's just the same as any other update. We may within the security team we, we may decide this is a uh, you know a high severity cve so we need to get this out in the next 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever it is but that just means we're going to get a release out very quickly um and it's just a you know it just goes through the same release process um and we do have folks in the uh, the limit security mailing list so we we have visibility to what's coming down the pike in terms of um you know urgent cves so we're, we're generally ready you'll see that when one of those high publicity, you know, high severity 
very public CVEs gets out. We're, you know, we're generally out there um, with, you know, with the other um, leading uh, distros kind of with a, with a patch straight away. Um, one other thing just, just to mention is, so we, we run the um, update, the public update server we run is basically headless um, from the customer, you know, from the user's perspective. Um, you can uh, take that update server and we've open sourced this. Um, this was actually something that um, CoreOS had that was proprietary only, and, but we've open sourced it so folks can run their own update server. And, uh, and, and this allows you to, to define a whole load of policies around how fast you want upgrade, you know, upgrades to be applied across, uh, across your fleet. So you can say, just do one per hour for the next, you know, 60 days or whatever it is. Um, and it's really nice to be able to see kind of graphically how the updates are, be are being applied. Uh, and even things like if an update start, you know, if you see that an update fails to get applied, uh, then you can break the update process and, you know, stop, up stop updating the fleet until you've worked out what's going on. So there's some pretty nice things there. Um, a lot of things we still want to do. Um, uh, hopefully, if there's one message that, <laughs> that you've taken away from, from this, it's that we're very community oriented. You know, we're not trying to push a particular vendor angle here or, you know, have an agenda. Uh, if the community wants to see, see things happen and they want to put in the energy and participate, then that's where it's going to go. Um, the biggest thing we're working on right now is, uh, it's, I guess it's a little bit under the hood, uh, but there's... Um, a, a couple of reasons why we want to start doing a lot more with a, a thing called systemd system extensions or sysext, um, it, which will enable people to do uh, to more easily deploy kind of custom versions with different container runtimes, and also for the what we call the OEM version. So that there's a there's a different uh, build which is released for Azure or for vSphere or, or you know for, for for certain clouds where there are agents that are specific to that platform. This will allow us to bake those in in a more uh, coherent way than just in that separate um, uh, disk volume that, that you saw. Um, there's still ongoing work to improve the build. We'll keep doing that. Um, uh, and uh, secure boot is, is one area that we don't support right now that I would love to see us um, from a security po point of view um, adding. And just really kind of growing, growing the community and you know, there's the board for what we have for roadmap is um, is in public, and um, you know, love to see folks here getting more involved. And you know, hopefully, with with us going through CNCF, if that goes to a successful conclusion. You know, we we just love to see that you know the community starting to um, you know really view this as you know as the you know the community's container Linux, um, something that in the same way that you know, Kubernetes is is not owned by any one vendor. We'd love to see uh, Flatcar in that same kind of role. So sorry, we said we wanted to make it interactive. We had a few questions there, um, but it was also a little bit of a presentation, sorry. Um, but hopefully that covered the the key areas of interest. And I've got, I've got a ton of backup slides if anyone wants to dig into technical detail on anything. I would like to ask a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm from Benefidencio, I, I work on different runtimes. Uh, and so I work on Kata containers. I know that Microsoft has been investing a little bit on Kata containers. Uh, I see some faces here. Uh, hey, Vincent. Yep. Uh, and of course, I would like, I would love to see like Kata containers being part of the default, like flat card image. And I would put effort into that. So what are the plans for that right now? And what is the approach that you guys are taking? And I'm asking this uh, mostly because I was one of the folks who got that into Red Hat Core OS. So being there, uh, done a few mistakes, correct those mistakes, and would be like really willing to hear and, and contribute to that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll speak. That's, that's... Yeah, go on. So um, Andy, you know, mentioned or the the system D sysext. Um, one of the things that we've kind of worked with for a while, and one of the really really smart but technical debt things that we kind of were grappling with 
that came over from uh, CoreOS was Torx, if you ever put your hands on it. Um, Torx existed since the beginning and it was kind of a way to have these importable um, components that were then like mounted and made available and they looked as if they were part of the system. <clears throat> and like how best to have these Torx pieces um, effectively have version control or some kind of update rollout of them. Uh, they were kind of on their own. Um, and I think a lot of evolution in the container world rendered them not, not quite aligned. Um, so using something that's much more baked into the OS um, is one of the approaches that we're taking. And it, it's also for the same thing that you're saying of like, uh, what if you're wanting to use Podman instead of the default Docker? What you like? How how could you do this? Pull it into the system and make sure that it like could possibly even be on its own update channel. So you could subscribe to like a a build of it that's like a long term stable or latest nightly of you know some feature component like this. Um, so that that and even plumbed into its own update service channel. So some you know publisher of say. In this situation, like a Kata, Kata CC nightly or, you know, release branch and users could just have like a system D sys extension that binds it and mounts it in. And it looks like it's just part of the system, but it doesn't have to change that core footprint um, is exactly the use case for this. Is this work public, Vincent? This is a bunch of design docs at this point and has been discussed in the, the flat car uh, matrix channel. Um, it's, but it is roadmapped work. <clears throat> um, and really we, we have gone through several iterations through the duration of us being here at Microsoft. And really a lot of that has evolved with the evolution of the system D six extensions upstream, like in the system D community. Um, but, uh, I'm sure we can get you a link or post it in here in the tag runtime, uh, or, or, or on the cut containers is like, that, that would be fine. Sure. Uh, yeah, like they, they, when when I was working for Red Hat, we thought about the approach of just like mounting, uh, well, in a different way, but like mounting the the Kata containers uh, a specific, well, the runtime and, and whatever it, it brings in. We end up with a problem that we would end up like having to to build components that Kata containers rely on. Uh, if you don't want to have everything like statically linked, we ha we will have to make sure that the Kata container is built exactly on the same system that that OpenShift is based, right? Uh, you don't want to, to run like a KMU or, or even like the Kata runtime linked with a two new uh, GDPC on a rail eight. That, that will just like cause you some, some issues. Uh, and and that's one of the challenges that we face with like just mounting. I, I'm pretty sure you guys uh, are aware of those, uh, but yeah, there are some, some, some challenges that made us end up like with just installing a new package via some kind of extension and making this extension channel like public to, to others. Yeah, no doubt. I, lo I, lo I look forward to brainstorming it with you because with all these solutions, there's uh, benefits and drawbacks, but yeah, there's some challenges there to iron out. We're, we're working through how to make that as smooth as possible. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to uh, engage some other community members to uh, like I I could think that maybe this could be used for web assembly modules for unit kernels for other things or maybe some of the other you know communities that might be interested in a standard yeah and, and there's there's always the challenge with uh kind of roadmap additional things that people want to add in is that conflict between wanting to support that additional use case and wanting to keep to the you know the 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 philosophical goal of being the minimal possible container base um and and that's where the sysext um, piece is really helpful because it means we can kind of do different spins which have people's custom um, addi additional components without bloating the uh yeah. you know the, the core distribution yeah and and also i think i mean you talked about fips and i don't know there's some orgs also interested in soft 2 and whatnot and 
introducing new components actually may make those teams or orgs reassess compliance right so because they're they need to make sure that maybe if they're bringing in like some new component and it's actually it doesn't have vulnerabilities or or doesn't have um yeah something that can compromise our system yeah Tila, you have your hand up uh yeah thanks um the Sussex thing in general general goes both ways for us right um it doesn't just enable um more or less arbitrary extensions for people to add um it, it goes it also goes into the different right direction like we have uh, quite a few use cases and um and users who approached us um and said having docker on the base image is too much like they don't need it they just talk to plain container d um having this uh these system extensions in place and a good way uh to guarantee compatibility testing having it in a in a release cycle and making it upgradable also would allow us to shrink the base image so that's the other direction that's uh that's in that path as well makes sense uh just to sum up the whole thing please uh keep me in the loop on that like i i i'm really interested in helping on this so uh Ricardo has a way to find me. Vincent has a really easy way to find me. So uh let's keep in touch. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I added three links to the to the meeting chat. The first is the uh existing documentation on SysX that we have in Flatcar. There's a there's a pointer in there to a GitHub repo that we call the SysX Bakery, and that's the current way to basically produce um this X for flat kind of in a pretty straightforward and simple manner and use them. Uh, it excludes like the whole, you know, complicated upgrade question, but it's a good place to start. Second link is to our metrics chat. Um, as uh, Andy mentioned, all of our maintainers are there. So if you just want to have a chat, um, for instance, if you just state your um, your purpose there, the thing that you want to that you want to do, I I bet you get a few people excited. Um, so just you know connect uh, and and get yourself help. The third one is our SDK, and that is a result of the um, investment we did into making Flatcar development more approachable. It's entirely container based, um, and there is a kind of a guideline that that gives you a step by step um a list of uh how to yeah work for flat car develop for flat car and produce your own images perfect thanks okay any other questions Hey guys, it's uh, Valentin. So I'm recently joining from on behalf of Eric Cement. Uh, so the flat car is something like distroless approach, right? I'm gonna check it out, but um, it's like it's trying so, to. Uh, I, yeah, I should have been. I should have kind of categorized that at the beginning. So it's uh, so it's flat car is not intended as a base image for containers. It's a it's it's a container host. So it's it's for the node that you run your containers on. Um, we wouldn't recommend it as a as a base for for um, you know for containerized workloads. So distro is typically a, applies to you know the a kind of a, a minimal approach to building containers. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to overview the project. It looks very nice. Thank you. But yeah, there's there's probably more packages in there than would qualify for it to be distroless. Yeah, because it's the entire infrastructure is here. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's so I guess, it's, I guess one similarity is that the it strips out the package manager because it, it it does the full re resolution, builds the partition for the OS, and so you if you wanted to look at package, you know what packages are actually used to render that image. It's an outside object. There's no package manager on it, but it is the host, not the container image itself. Yeah, I was doing something like uh, distroless packet managers 
uh, back in VMware. And uh, we were doing that for one of the events. And we were trying to do something like unified pocket manager, but that was for distroless. And here I can see like there's no package installation or modification of the cores. Awesome. Yep. Thanks. We got one minute left. I don't know if anybody else has any other question. This has been great. So the, the project is in Sandbox now and it's uh, going for incubation in the CNCF? No, so it's 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 not in CNCF at the moment. We've uh, just put in a proposal uh, to go straight to incubation. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, you have a lot of adoption and, and users, so I think it, yeah, that's what they're looking for so in terms of you know, incubation. Yeah, yeah I, I, we we looked at the criteria and we figured, yeah, it. I, we think we can check those off. So why not go yeah. straight for it? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it's, the community is mature. Uh, yeah, and even you can even think about graduation maybe after a year or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think you know be. You know, being completely open about it, you know, we would like, we would need to see more community participation kind of at an engineering level before I think folks would say it was ready for graduation. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, but I think we'll get there. I think the structure is there for, for a reason, I guess, in the CNCF. <laughs> yeah. I was discussing with Ricardo offline and, um, any any thoughts about confidential computing or how you're you're going to approach that in, in coming years? I think it's still still work in progress and there is work in, in confidential containers and probably relates to some question with Kata and all that previously, but it would be interesting to hear your your thinking on that. Yeah, I mean I, I would like to have Vincent take that because he's been doing a lot of work on confidential containers. Yeah, see, Tilo's got his hands up also. So I'm sure we got a couple of angles we could slice at this. Um, I will I will step in since my name was called. Ha, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are at time, so I want to be respectful of that. So um, there there is work um, that has been done and is is expected to be done to continue kind of like tying all the, the ends of like TPM measurements and otherwise through the stack. Um, completely separate to Flatcar entirely. There is also work that uh, Flatcar, Flatcar does not intend to carry patches uh, as a lot of OSs do to enable things like in the kernel and otherwise. Uh, it really, in, you know, as, as quickly and as much as we can remove patches that are carried from our tree so that we're just using the upstream sources, the better. So in that effort, uh, a lot of our confidential compute and otherwise enabling and lighting up different hardware and actual hardware and even being a guest on different VMs would be how can we make sure that those things are upstreamed and tested so that we can just have the minimal uh, like kernel pieces lit up so that it's has a similar user experience across different, you know, cloud cloud get, you know, as a cloud guest or hardware uh, is the big focus there. So there's kind of two different pieces there, whether you're thinking like TDX, TDX, AMD, SP pieces, or just actual measurements of seeing that you booted something, you can, you know, have a, a DM Verity read only uh, user partition measure that the state that you actually came up in and verify that through like the TPM. Um, those are two different avenues that we're keeping our eyes on. Okay. We got a, a few. I mean, we're out of time, but uh, I think if you can stick around for a little bit, I think Alex has a question or, and just raise his hand. Hey, apologies. Yeah, sorry for the late question. And apologies for, um, <laughs> it's definitely over time. Um, so, hi, yeah, I'm from a uh, Unicraft. We're a unikernel project. Um, and so we build our integrations into container runtimes, et cetera. So, um, this question is more about like the support for adding additional packages that are supported for um, like virtual running virtual machines essentially. So you know, a unikernel is a virtual machine. 
um, and the kind of support that the project has. I'm actually not very familiar with that card. It's the first time I heard about it today. Um, whether you've heard of, for example, micro VM use cases with Flatcar Linux, um, and if anything has occurred in this space. Yeah, Tila, do you want to take that? Uh, that and then circling back to yeah. digital computing real quick. So we we had a few users actually who, who dabbled with um, uh, Flatcar as a micro VM guest um just accelerating boot times and then executing one distinct workload and then shutting down real quick so that's the that's the thing that i know about uh regarding making flat car the host i think the, the answer is kind of the same as for as for kata containers um a good thing to add that that feature would be having it in a separate um this x layer but it, it always depends what you actually want to do right uh yeah. would you like to have flat car being the micro vm guest and then maybe run a container on it or no, this is the, it's almost the inverse so you would imagine we have the physical machine runs flat car you provision it over a network and then okay. that would be able to you know along with the container d runtime for example have additional you know it, it would have the host would have access to um virtual machine instruction set and would be able to launch for example can you something via can you Oh, gotcha. So that that's the the, the for, for us from the from the operating system point of view, that's pretty much the cutter use case. So um, the way to do that is um, to work with the SDK to add the necessary packages, uh, mm -hmm. the 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 gentle ebuilds um, to the to the flat car repositories, and then from that, or even you know, use your own repos, and then um, publish a sysx and just add your own bits in in in, in that sysx. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, going just briefly back to confidential computing, uh, from a pure engineering perspective, um, we're looking at, you know, making the respective bits available in Flatcar, making Flatcar um, compatible with the uh, kind of a secure boot chain that you need to have um, with confidential and trusted computing. And there's this... Um, there's this, uh, let, let's call it interest group, special interest group that has founded itself recently. Um, so we call ourselves the UAPI group, which is very unspecific, but the focus is basically um, to have a forum for many distros to talk about exactly like these, these low level security bits, how to access TPMs, how to do measure, uh, how to, yeah, well, standardized measurements um, and how to secure the boot chain. Uh, Flatcar has been one of the founding members there. And um, yeah, we, we interoperate uh, with other distros on, on that in particular there as well. Link is in the chat. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we could uh, continue the discussion on the chat or offline. Uh, everybody's available on Slack. So uh, any other questions, you can, we can follow up through that or or through email or any any way possible through cyberspace. <laughs> Thanks, Ricardo. Really yeah. appreciate you uh, hosting us here and making the time available and taking like so much time to talk about it something we're passionate about and happy to um share that with the community yep all right thank, thank you, you. thanks thank so you. much everyone bye bye bye, bye. bye. thank you bye, -bye. bye. thanks bye